mother talking to her new baby, the scrunch of leaves on a bright autumn day, a hound baying in the woods at night, the absolute silence of a mountain lake at sunset, seagulls crying, a stadium crowd singing the national anthem, a crackling fire on a bitter day, a distant train whistle. Those are just a few of one person's list of favorite sounds. Hello once again, I'm Don Jackson with the heartbeat of the internet. Many of us will remember the whistle of a passing steam locomotive. Today, the horns are much louder. Due to a generation that is so plugged in to electronic devices, But there was a much simpler time in our history when there was a certain romance associated with the rails. Edna St. Vincent Millay wrote, The railroad track is miles away, and the day ahead is loud with voices speaking. Yet there isn't a train goes by all day, but I hear its whistle shrieking. All night there isn't a train goes by, though the night is still for sleep and dreaming. But I see its cinders red on the sky, and hear its engine steaming. My heart is worn with the friends I make, and better friends I'll not be knowing. Yet there isn't a train I wouldn't take, no matter where it's going. D. H. Lawrence was on a train in England when an image passed before his eyes that compelled him to write these words. This is called Kisses in the Train. I saw the Midlands revolve through her hair, the fields of autumn stretching bare, and sheep on the pasture tossed back in a scare. Carl Sandburg might also have been in that same train, inspired not by a daylight scene, but by what can be glimpsed through a train's window at night. We can see out that same window in our minds. Night, from a railroad car window, is a great, dark, soft thing, broken across with slashes of light. The end of summer to many has always meant an end to innocence and ease. It also means saying goodbye to those who must follow the summer on to its next destination. I'm sure you must remember that there is a very special train platform in England known only to a select few. A scarlet steam engine was waiting next to a platform packed with people. A sign overhead said Hogwarts Express, 11 o'clock. Harry looked behind him and saw a wrought iron archway where the ticket box had been with the words platform nine and three quarters on it. He had done it. Smoke from the engine drifted over the heads of the chattering crowd, while cats of every color wound here and there between their legs. Owls hooted to each other in a disgruntled sort of way over the babble and the scraping of heavy trunks. Again, J.K. Rowling writes, The train began to move. Harry saw the boy's mother waving and their sister half laughing, half crying, running to keep up with the train until it gathered too much speed. Then she fell back and waved. Some excerpts from Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, published in 2000. And if not a wizard, then maybe a spy. 
He drove me back to catch the last train for London, and we arranged to meet at the same time on the next Saturday. And he stood and waved for as long as I could see him under the yellow lights of that darling little station. And so our real love affair began. It was always the same, with perhaps different places for luncheon and high tea. The river, the gramophone, the little box in the cinema. An excerpt from Part 1, Chapter 3 of The Spy Who Loved Me by Ian Fleming. Even James Bond had to rely on a train once in a while. To realize the value of one minute, ask a person who has missed the train. An unknown writer with the value of time. And for one who makes it on time and is seated next to a stranger, you realize that you never really know who you will meet on a train journey and what lesson you might learn. This is an excerpt from an article by Carol Tavares that appeared in the May 1983 issue of New Woman. And I quote, On the train to Brindavan, a swami sat beside a common man who asked him if indeed he had attained self-mastery, as the name Swami implies. I have, says the Swami. And have you mastered anger? I have. Do you mean to say that you have mastered anger? I have. You mean you can control your anger? I can. And you do not feel anger? I do not. Is this the truth, Swami? It is. After a silence, the man asks again. Do you really feel that you have controlled your anger? I have, as I told you, the Swami answers. Then, do you mean to say you never feel anger, even? You're going on and on. What do you want? The Swami shouts. Are you a fool? What I have told you. Oh, Swami, this is anger. You have not messed... Oh, but I have, the Swami interrupts. Have you not heard about the abused snake? Let me tell you a story. On a path that went by a village in Bengal, there lived a cobra who used to bite people on their way to worship at the temple there. As the incidents increased, everyone became fearful and many refused to go to the temple. The Swami, who was the master at the temple, was aware of the problem and took it upon himself to put an end to it. Taking himself to where the snake dwelt, he used a mantra to call the snake to him and bring it into submission. The Swami then said to the snake that it was wrong to bite the people who walked along the path to worship and made him promise sincerely that he would never do it again. Soon it happened that the snake was seen by a passerby upon the path, and it made no move to bite him. Then it became known that the snake had somehow been made passive, and people grew unafraid. It was not long before the village boys were dragging the poor snake along behind them as they ran laughing here and there. When the temple swami passed that way again, he called the snake to see if he had kept his promise. The snake humbly and miserably approached the Swami, who exclaimed, You are bleeding. Tell me how this has come to be. The snake was near tears and blurted out that he had been abused ever since he was caused to make his promise to the Swami. I told you not to bite, said the Swami, but I did not tell you not to hiss. Many people, like the Swami's cobra, confuse the hiss with the bite. It is an understandable mistake. Here's another lesson that was learned the hard way by a very famous university. It reminds me that you're never too old or too bright to stop learning. 
and you never know who might walk off a train with the power to change your world. And I quote, A lady in a faded gingham dress and her husband, dressed in a homespun, threadbare suit, stepped off the train in Boston and walked timidly, without an appointment, into the president of Harvard's outer office. The secretary could tell in a moment that such backwoods country folk had no business at Harvard and probably didn't even deserve to be in Cambridge. She frowned. We want to see the president, the man said softly. He'll be busy all day, the secretary snapped. We'll wait, the lady replied. For hours, the secretary ignored them, hoping that the couple would finally become discouraged and go away. They didn't, and the secretary grew frustrated and finally decided to disturb the president, even though it was a chore she always regretted to do. Maybe if they just see you for a few minutes, they'll leave, she told him. He sighed in exasperation and nodded. Someone of his importance obviously didn't have the time to spend with him, but he detested gingham and homespun suits cluttering his office. The president, stern-faced with dignity, strutted toward the couple. The lady told him, we had a son that attended Harvard for one year. He loved Harvard and was very happy here. But about a year ago, he was accidentally killed, and my husband and I would like to erect a memorial to him somewhere on campus. The president wasn't touched. He was shocked. Madam, he said gruffly, we can't put a statue for every person who attended Harvard and died. If we did, this place would look like a cemetery. Oh no, the lady explained quickly. We don't want to erect a statue. We thought we would give a building to Harvard. The president rolled his eyes. He glanced at the gingham dress and homespun suit, then exclaimed, a Building? Do you have any earthly idea how much a building costs? We have over seven and a half million dollars in the physical plant at Harvard. For a moment, the lady was silent. The president was pleased he could get rid of them now. The lady turned to her husband and said quietly, is that all it costs to start a university? Why don't we just start our own? Her husband nodded. The president's face wilted in confusion and bewilderment. Mr. and Mrs. Leland Stanford walked away, traveling to Palo Alto, California, where they established the university that bears their name, a memorial to a son that Harvard no longer cared about. As this writer concludes by quoting Malcolm Forbes, you can easily judge character of others by how they treat those who can do nothing for them or to them. This is called The Station by Robert J. Hastings. Tucked away in our subconscious minds is an idyllic vision. We see ourselves on a long, long trip that almost spans the continent. We're traveling by passenger train and out the windows we drink in the passing scene of cars on nearby highways, of children waving at the crossing, of cattle grazing on a distant hillside, of smoke pouring from a power plant, of row upon row of corn and wheat, of flatlands and valleys, of mountains and rolling hillsides, of city skylines and village halls, of biting winter and blazing summer, and cavorting spring and docile fall. But uppermost in our minds is the final destination. On a certain day, at a certain hour, we will pull into the station. There will be bands playing and flags waving. And once we get there, so many wonderful dreams will come true. So many wishes will be fulfilled. And so many pieces of our lives, finally, will be neatly fitted together like a completed jigsaw puzzle. How restlessly we pace the aisles, damning the minutes for loitering, waiting, waiting, waiting for the station. 
However, sooner or later, we must realize there is no one station, no one place to arrive at once and for all. The true joy of life is the trip. The station is only a dream. It constantly outdistances us. When we reach the station, that will be it, we cry. Translated, it means, when I'm 18, that will be it. When I buy a new Mercedes-Benz, that will be it. When I put the last kid through college, that will be it. When I have paid off the mortgage, that will be it. When I win a promotion, that will be it. When I reach the age of retirement, that will be it. I shall live happily ever after. Unfortunately, once we get it, then it disappears. The station somehow hides itself at the end of an endless track. As Robert J. Hastings concludes, it isn't the burdens of today that drive men mad. Rather, it is regret over yesterday or fear of tomorrow. Regret and fear are twin thieves who would rob us of today. So stop pacing the aisles and counting the miles. Instead, climb more mountains, eat more ice cream, go barefoot more often, swim more rivers, watch more sunsets, laugh more, and cry less. Life must be lived as we go along. The station will come soon enough. The carnival train thundered the bridge. The calliope wailed. There's no one playing it, Jim stared up. Going away, away. The calliope pipes shimmered with star explosions, but no one sat at the high keyboard. The wind sluicing ice water in the pipes made the music. The boys ran. The train curved away, gonging its undersea funeral bell, sunk, rusted, green mossed, tolling, tolling. Then the engine's whistle blew a great steam whiff, and Will broke out in pearls of ice. Way late at night, Will had heard, how often, train whistles jetting steam along the rim of sleep, forlorn, alone, and far no matter how near they came. Sometimes he woke to find tears on his cheek, asked why, lay back, listened, and thought, yes, they make me cry, going east, going west. A line later, Ray Bradbury continues, those trains and their grieving sounds were lost forever between stations, not remembering where they had been not guessing where they might go, exhaling their last pale breaths over the horizon. Gone. So it was with all trains, ever. This train's whistle, the wails of a lifetime were gathered in it from other nights in slumbering years, the howl of moon-dreamed dogs, the seat of river-cold winds through January porch screens which stopped the blood. A thousand fire sirens, weeping, or worse, the outgone shreds of breath, the protests of a billion people, dead or dying, not wanting to be dead. Their groans, their sighs, burst over the earth. Then the billion voices ceased instantly, as if the train had plunged in a firestorm off the earth. End quote. An excerpt from Chapter 12 of Something Wicked This Way Comes by Ray Bradbury and published by Avon Books. Thought the scene appropriate for this time in the year. Bradbury continues, The train had pulled off into Rolf's Moon Meadow, so-called because town couples came out to see the moon rise here over a land so wide, so long, it was like an inland sea filled with grass in spring, or hay in late summer, or snow in winter. 
It was fine walking here along its crisp shore with the moon coming up to tremble in its tides. Well, the carnival train was crouched there, now in the autumn grass on the old rail spur near the woods, and the boys crept and lay down under a bush. Waiting. It's so quiet, whispered Will. The train just stood in the middle of the dry autumn field. No one in the locomotive. No one in the tender. No one in any of the cars behind. All black under the moon. And just the small sounds of its metal cooling, ticking on the rails. End quote. You never know where some of the trains of autumn have their origin. And if you didn't know any better, you might be lulled into believing that these great iron beasts with their hissing, ticking, and sighing might actually be some form of life. As I might have said before, is a long train ride during which friends and loved ones disembark unexpectedly, leaving us to continue our travels in ever increasing loneliness. Here was another station on the line. An excerpt from the novel Twilight Eyes by Dean R. Koontz, published in 87 by Berkeley Books. Wet Earth random flowers, mingling, rattling leaves in the wet summer air, all the night songs, scent of the river only eight blocks from here over the Irish Channel, where a train whistle cut the night, leading the distant soft roar of boxcars. An excerpt from Blood Canticle, The Vampire Chronicles by Anne Rice, published in 2003 by Alfred A. Knopf. Even one of Anne Rice's moody immortals in New Orleans could appreciate the sound of a train on a sultry summer night. This is an excerpt from Whistling Through Dixie by Marta Burton from the Saturday Evening Post, and I quote, In Alabama, if you're past a certain age, the lonesome, mournful wail of a train whistle is somewhere in your soul, calling up the good old days before five and dime became five dollars. Rare is the native who doesn't remember his first train ride or won't relate to it in misty-eyed, minute detail to anyone who will listen. E.B. White wrote, In a Pullman berth, a man can truly be alone with himself. The nearest approach to this condition is to be found in a hotel bedroom, but a hotel room can be mighty depressing sometimes. It stands so still, end quote. I hope you've seen that the mournful train whistle that sounds romantic in summer can have a completely different effect come the fall. Well, the train is just about ready to pull into the station for its last stop on the journey I began at the beginning of this webcast. I hope you've enjoyed the ride with me. We'll take this journey again sometime soon. And don't worry about the tickets. I've already reserved your seats. Good night, sweet dreams. I'm Don Jackson.